So hello everyone to the second part of this uh, new uh, Gand seminars, let's say. Uh, again, uh, for this week we have Kostas Karagiannis from Manchester who is going to talk again about polynomial variants of finite group schemes. And uh, this is the second part. So Costa, you can start. And thank you again. Thank you, Aguilé. Um, okay, so uh, before I start, um, let me address something that was asked to me um, at the discussion at the end of the of the talks. Uh, I was asked to give some references. Um, of course, there are various different textbooks that um, one can find info on the subject, uh, but these are the four that uh, I have been using uh, at least the past few years, uh, and somehow. I have um, ordered them in, in, in descending order of accessibility, at least in my case. So the most accessible is Waterhouse's uh, introduction to fine group schemes um, with lots of examples, lots of exercises, but um, it's more appropriate for just a master's course. It doesn't go um, as deep into the details as the others. Um, I think the most accessible and complete for my taste, is Milne's book on algebraic groups. You can also find versions of it online in his website. Um, and then the classical textbooks, if you wish, on the subject are Janssen's uh, represent representations of algebraic groups, especially the first part is relevant to what we have been doing. In the second part, uh, he delves deeper into, into the case of reduced um, uh, group schemes, so group varieties. Uh, and of course, the standard reference where everyone can find anything they want uh, if they can read it, of course, is uh, the Mazur Gabriel book, uh, which is, if you want, the, the, the analog of, uh, of an SGA or an EGA treatment. Um, okay, so, so let me start. Uh, let me start by just uh, a recap of the, of the previous lecture, um, previously on polynomial environment uh, invariance of group schemes. Uh, I have dropped the F should be in the acronym, but I have dropped it for, for, for obvious reasons. Um, so what we did last time uh, is we um, first motivated our problem from classical invariant theory of finite groups. Uh, so if we have a finite group acting on a polynomial ring over some field, uh, then M in other proved that the invariants are a finitely generated K algebra. Uh, and that uh, over the complex numbers, uh, the order of the group provides a bound uh, for the degrees of the generators. Uh, and this was generalized many years later by uh, James Fogarty and Peter Fleischmann uh, uh, independently. Um, they proved that bounds, uh, that nethers down hold over a field uh, of arbitrary characteristic as long as we are in the ordinary representation. Um, and finally, uh, the problem was settled in 2011 by Peter Simons, who proved that uh, when the order, uh, when the characteristic of the field does divide the order of the group, uh, then uh, the degrees of the generators are bounded by the number of the variables times the order of the group minus. Group. So uh, we said that we're going to talk about generalizations. And of course, there are numerous different paths one can take. The path that we are taking in the series of talks is to generalize the acting object uh, from a finite group uh, to a finite group scheme. Uh, so we gave uh, four uh, essentially equivalent viewpoints as definitions of a group scheme. Uh, the first is the functorial. So a group scheme is a representable functor from a finite scheme to groups, or more appropriately, the scheme that represents a representable. Uh, or we can define it as a group object in the category of affine schemes, uh, meaning an affine scheme equipped with three extra morphisms, modeling, group multiplication, um, the identity element, and group inverse. Or we can start with a commutative Hopf algebra and take its prime spectrum. Okay. Uh, or we can start on the representation theoretic side from a non-commutative, but co-commutative Hopf algebra, okay, which models the group algebra of the finite group, dualize it to get a commutative Hopf algebra, so we go one step above in the bullet points, 
um, and then take the prime spec. Okay, so we have functorial viewpoint, which from Yoneda's lemma is equivalent to the geometric viewpoint, which by the spec functor is equivalent to the commutative Hopf viewpoint, which by Hopf duality is equivalent to the co-commutative Hopf viewpoint. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, last time I was told that in some cases I was not being heard very well. Uh, if this is the case, please let me know. And also, if you have anything you would like to ask or add or correct me, uh, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, okay, so uh, then we proceed um, with some examples. I went a bit hastily uh, over this slide at the end of the lecture. Um, so in contrast to what happens with finite groups, where we have only one um, isomorphism class of a finite group of order P for a P a prime, in the group scheme case, we have three different group schemes. Uh, so in this example, um, in this table, uh, each row represents a different group scheme and each column represents a different viewpoint. Okay, functorial, commutative algebraic representation. So the first one is the cyclic group of order P. Uh, this is better understood or defined, if you wish, from its group algebra. A polynomial ring in one variable modulo, um, the ideal generated by t to the p minus one. And we showed that its k dual is a separable algebra, a product of um, copies of the ground field. And there is also a functorial description that we did not discuss. And I don't want to get into the details, I just put it there for completeness. The second group scheme is the one of roots of unity, which is better understood functorially, right? So we take the functor that to each algebra, it assigns the elements of the multiplicative group whose pth power is one. And one can prove that the coordinate ring of that scheme is isomorphic as a Hopf algebra to the group algebra of the complete group, okay. and vice versa, dually, the group algebra of that scheme is isomorphic to the coordinate ring of the cycle. And then we have a third object, which is, if you wish, the additive version of the root of the group. Alpha stands for additive, okay? Where we take the group elements in the additive group of P, whose pth power is zero, okay? Who have order equal to P. And one can prove in this case that both the coordinate ring and the group algebra uh, are given by this um, quotient, this truncated polynomial. Okay. And they turn out to be actually isomorphic as Hopf algebra. Right? Uh, so this is a very well-known theorem of Tate and North from the 1970s, uh, that uh, over a field of characteristic P, uh, these three group schemes are the only group schemes of order P, uh, and actually they are pairwise uh, non-isomorphic. Okay. We said, that the fact that CP, the cyclic group, is not isomorphic to the other two uh, is kind of trivial because they're not even isomorphic as schemes, okay, as rings, because this coordinate ring here um, has no nil potents, so it's reduced. Okay. Whereas uh, over a field of characteristic P, both of these rings have nil potents. Okay, so they can't be isomorphic as schemes. However, me and alpha are isomorphic as schemes because these two K algebras over a field of characteristic P are isomorphic, right? You can factor T to the P minus one as T minus one to the P, the freshman stream in characteristic P. So as schemes, they are isomorphic, but the group structure is different, okay? Why? Because essentially their duals are not isomorphic. So if these were isomorphic as Hopf algebras, then their duals would be isomorphic as well. And this is not. Okay, so let me start, um, I think my numbering is correct, episodes one and two were in the previous lecture. Let me start now with episode uh, three, uh, discussing actions and invariants. Okay. So the four viewpoints that we have on group schemes, functorial, geometric, commutative algebraic, representation, okay. carry also to any affine scheme, almost carry also, 
also, right? Because any affine scheme can be given as a functor, as a geometric object, or through its coordinate algebra. But if we don't have a group structure, we don't have the representation theoretic side, right? Okay. When we dualize a coordinate algebra, if it's not a Hopf algebra, then this is not going to give us a ring. Okay. So if you want to define an action of a group scheme on a scheme, okay, you can do this essentially vertically in each column. Okay. You can have your group functor act on this functor, or you can have a geometric action, okay, from G cross X to X, which is a morphism of schemes satisfying some compatibility properties. Or you can take the spec construction or the inverse, okay? You can take global sections of the structure sheaf uh, and get a map the other direction from the coordinate ring of X to the tensor product of the coordinate rings. And this, these maps satisfying the uh, natural compatibility properties are what we call co-module maps, okay? In the language of co-algebras or homogebras. Uh, and finally, you can give a representation theoretic um, definition uh, in the sense of, you know, uh, an action of a finite dimensional algebra on another algebra uh, is just giving it the structure um, of a module uh, by tensor product. Okay. Uh, so we have these four viewpoints for actions. Uh, and uh, let's see a couple of examples. Okay. The, 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 the trivial example is the case of finite groups. Okay. So if we have uh, the cyclic group of order P uh, over a field of characteristic P acting on a polynomial ring in two variables. The action essentially is given on the variables. Okay, So you have the generator of the cyclic group that maps X into X okay, and Y to X plus Y. This is your upper triangular matrix if you want. Okay, And then T squared will still map X to X but then y to 2x plus y, right? Because every time you add an x. So the natural way to see this representation uh, from undergraduate representation theory is via the group algebra, right? Uh, so what you do, you act with uh, the element t to the i of that ring uh, by essentially applying this rule that we just described, okay? Now, in the previous lectures, I, I showed you very briefly how you go from modules to commodules. Uh, so I will not elaborate, but when you dualize this map, um, you get a map from S to S tensor, the dual of that algebra, okay? Uh, and uh, maybe I will just explain uh, that this is well-defined, just that this makes sense, okay? Not how you get the actual formula. Uh, so this first argument here uh, is the result of the action of T to the J on F, okay? So by the previous line, this is an element of S, okay? And then I tensor with this element E sub J. Uh, this element E sub J is the, the J basis element of this set of R, okay? If you wish, it's the dual to the group element T to the J, okay? So this is an element which uh, belongs to the coordinate thing. And this gives me a well-defined map. And if the first map satisfies associativity and uniquality, uh, then the second map will satisfy co-associativity and co-uniquality. Of course, there's nothing special in this example with the cyclic group. Okay? This can be carried over to any finite group. Uh, and actually, this is more or less the way you go from um, a module to a co-module in Hopper, right? So if you're given an action of some group element G on um, ring elements F, then you can define the co-module map as a sum. These GF are elements of S. And then you tensor with the dual basis element to the group. So this is a map from an algebra to S tensor another algebra. You apply spec and you get a map from spec K gamma, which is gamma, okay, from a scheme times fiber product with spec S onto spec S, and this is your action of the group. Okay, this is somehow the trivial example 
uh, of a group scheme emission. Now for a different viewpoint, uh, let's look at an example of a Lie algorithm. I mentioned last time that one of the motivations for introducing group schemes uh, was that um, to unify a representation theory of finite groups with representation theory of the algebras. Okay. So in our example, let's take a very simple, very easy, okay, not simple in the mathematical terms, a very easy Lie algebra, SL2, traceless two by two matrices over a field of characteristic P, which is not true. Uh, the basis uh, is very well known to be given by these three matrices, E, F, and H. The Lie bracket is also very well known uh, to be given by these formulas. So we can define a sort of differential wise action, uh, which is a canonical action on a polynomial ring in two variables, where we let the first element E act as X times partial derivative with respect to what this does on a monomial x to the alpha, y to the beta, it multiplies x to the alpha, so you get x to the alpha plus 1, and you apply derivative to y, so you get beta times y to the beta minus 1. Okay. Uh, f acts symmetrically. Okay. Multiply with y derivative with x. So x to the alpha becomes alpha x to the alpha minus 1, and y to the beta becomes y to the beta minus 1. And then H, because it's diagonal, right? it's a, not diagonal, but with a negative um, sign, uh, then it's somehow more symmetric. So what happens here is that the polynomial ring becomes a module for the algebra through that action. But we know that uh, modules for the algebras are the same as modules for the universal, universal enveloping algebra, okay? The free associative algebra on the same number of generators, module of the relations coming from the bracket. So this gives us the map from USL2 tensor S to S. And this USL2 plays the role of AG, okay, of the group algebra. Because the universal enveloping algebra is co-commutative, so it's dual is commutative, so we can take the spectrum. Okay. So if you follow through the arrows essentially of the different viewpoints that I showed you here from right to left, from USL2, you end up to some G. And this gives you an action of that group scheme on uh, a fine space, uh, two dimensional fine space. Okay. And now let's proceed to discussing invariants. Again, we have four viewpoints. It's going to become a little tiring. I'm not going every time to give you all different versions. Invariants in this case are defined much better algebraically than they are generically. Okay. So the easiest way is to use the trivial action of the group of, right? So the invariants consist of all the elements S and S, uh, on which all the elements of the group algebra act trivially. But careful, trivial does not mean that X times S is S. It means that X times S is the augmentation map evaluated at x times. Okay, one needs to be careful, and this will become evident with an example uh, in the next slide. Dually, you can define invariants using the trivial coaction. So you can take the dual to tough, which is sigma, and you can form the invariants as all the elements in S, such that sigma of S is trivial, which means it's equal to sigma times one. Okay. The third viewpoint is not clear and not correct the way I have written it. Okay. Uh, one can think of the geometric counterpart to these constructions as orbits. Okay. Uh, so you can think of the orbits of the functorial or the geometric function, which is the quotient of the space you're acting on by the action as an equivalence relation, if you want, okay? So this is an orbit space, at least topologically. It's not clear that this is a scheme, that the functor is representable and so on. This is all the um, work behind Mumford's uh, geometric invariant theory. But the point I want us to keep here is that invariants are essentially functions on the orbit, okay? Or if you wish that the spec functor transforms 
invariance into orbits and orbits into invariance, as is the case for classic um, finite groups. Okay. So let's see these two examples, cyclic group and SL2. Let's see what the invariance is. Okay. For the cyclic group, again, it's easy to describe in terms of the group algebra, right? So an element of the group T to the I acts trivially if and only if F of X comma I X Y is the same as F of X Y. You can try solving this equation, right? Write down F as a sum of monomials and so on. And you will figure out uh, that the invariants here are generated by X clearly because X is invariant. And the other form you want is y to the p minus x to the p minus one y. Okay, you can at least as an exercise verify that this is invariant, which is easy, uh, but it's not very hard to show that this gives you the full invariance. Now, in the case of SL two, um, with the action with partial derivatives that I gave you in the previous slide, uh, it can be shown that the invariance of this action are actually generated by x to the p and y to the p, okay? But this seems counterintuitive, at least to representation theorists of finite groups, because if you plug the monomial x to the p, y to the p into that expression, you get zero, right? You differentiate y to the p, means you multiply with p over a field of characteristic p, which is zero, okay? So, Everything that is a pth power gets mapped to zero by all of these elements. Uh, but this is consistent because this is the definition of invariance in the algebra, right? And the reason for that is we said that an element of a group algebra, and group algebra in the sense of the dual of the coordinate ring for a group scheme, okay, acts trivially if and only if x times s is the augmentation map evaluated at x times s. So in the case of groups, the augmentation map sends everything to one. So we retrieve the formula x s equals s. But in the Lie algebra case for the universal enveloping algebra, we saw last time that the augmentation map takes everything to zero. So trivial if and only if x times s is zero, okay? So that behavior is slightly different. So now um, I will motivate um, the techniques that we will use to compute invariants. Okay. And as I did last time, I had this small silly section, which was like a comic book. Um, so I tried doing the same uh, for this uh, part, just to try to motivate you for uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, for the rest of today's talk. Okay, uh, so group schemes as old schemes were thoroughly studied by the French school led by uh, Alexander Grothendieck in France. Um, so sometimes in the SGA seminars, of course, this was not the statement, uh, but essentially what happened um, uh, implicitly, uh, people claim that invariant theory of group schemes generalizes invariant theory of finite groups. Uh, so the mathematical community um, naturally asked whether uh, the result of nether for finite groups can be carried on in that context. Uh, is it true that invariants are still finitely generated? Uh, and Grothendieck, uh, being a bit cryptic, you know, he, he, he gave a response, uh, but phrased uh, slightly differently. Uh, he, he claimed that uh, the extension from the invariance to the actual ring is infinite. Uh, of course, this implies finite generation uh, by the artin tate lemma, Okay, that says that if you have an integral extension of commutative rings uh, and the top ring is finitely generated, then so is the bottom. Okay, uh, and of course, these, these pictures uh, don't match chronologically, right? Uh, because uh, this Tate's picture is like from, I don't know, 10 years ago, uh, whereas Artin's picture is from the, possibly the 50s or the 60s. Uh, Tate was a student of Emil Artin, right? And I think 1951 or somewhere around that time, uh, was the date that Tate got his PhD under Artin's uh, supervision. Okay, so we have finite generation. And as was the case with the mathematical community um, during Nether's time, uh, the next question is how do we find the generator? Okay, 
what can we say about them? Can we bound the degrees at least, you know? Um, so what is a technique we can use? And uh, the technique that was uh, really well known from even the previous century that goes back to Hilbert and was used uh, very efficiently by Nether uh, is that the bounds can be read from uh, free resolution. Okay. Uh, however, uh, even to this day, uh, free resolutions are notoriously hard to read. Okay. This is a picture from a conference maybe last year or two years back on computational commutative algebra, um, uh, just randomly found on the internet. I think the person in the back is, is, is Bernd Stubfels, who is maybe one of the leading figures of that subject. Uh, in any case, when you say it's difficult for resolution to be computed, do you mean to describe them or you actually compute them? Uh, both. I mean, you both. can do computations okay. with a computer, uh, oh. uh, but uh, still there are, um, computationally, it's a very hard problem. Okay. Uh, there are algorithms, uh, but if you input something really large, then uh, it's hopeless. And also it's very difficult to get concrete answers on the okay, okay. numbers and so on. So it does have both theoretical and computational. Exactly. Yes, yes. Okay. Both, uh, they are definitely uh, very active, both on the computational side and on the theoretical side. Um, uh, okay, so so resolutions are difficult um, computationally, at least, to handle. Um, so we need to transfer to another real. Okay, and that other real was still introduced by Dick, uh, 1961 in the Harvard seminars introduced the concept of local cohomology. Okay. And he proved the theorem which became known as Grothendieck's local duality theorem, which allows us to pass from the world of free resolution to that world of local cohomology. Okay. Uh, of course, at the moment, you don't know what these words mean. Okay, I will explain. That's the point of the second half of my talk. Uh, by the way, this picture is not from Harvard seminars, I just decided to put it because uh, I think the guy that is enjoying a glass of wine in the back is, is Sir. Okay. Uh, so I just like the picture. Um, okay, so uh, local cohomology. Um, but again, when the Grothendieck introduced it, it was very difficult, um, uh, mostly uh, conceptually, uh, but also computationally. And uh, at Harvard at the time, um, a PhD student was there, uh, Robin Harcher, which you probably know from his algebraic geometry textbook. Uh, but he, he, he took notes, he helped write up Grothendieck's seminars uh, into a book, and he actually contributed a lot to the theory of local cohomology. Uh, however, this was not enough, and the crucial contribution uh, to the problem that we are studying uh, came from David Mumford, uh, in 1966, he was also there uh, for the um, Grothendieck seminars, uh, studying under Zariski uh, in Harvard. Uh, and his idea was to look back into the Italian school of algebraic geometry from the previous century to the work of Guido Castelnuovo. Um, of course, uh, if one reads Castelnuovo's work from 1893, uh, it's impossible to understand, at least to me, the relation, you know, Castelnuovo's statement is something about uh, pencils of divisors on complex curves, um, whereas local cohomology is a very abstract cohomology theory. Um, however, Mumford insisted and he was able to develop the theory of regularity, uh, which um, he attributed to Castelnuovo. The name that we use nowadays is Castelnuovo Mumford regularity. Um, and maybe just as a side, um, all these names that I've been mentioning today um, are related genealogically. So I don't think that this is a coincidence that uh, Castelnuovo's most famous student was Oscar Zariski. Um, and Oscar Zariski in Harvard supervised both Harcher and Mumford. Uh, and Mumford supervised Fogarty's thesis. Fogarty was, remember, the person who proved another's bound um, for more general fields. Okay. So this is a puzzle of statements that I've shown. Okay, from three resolutions to local cohomology and so on. Uh, and this puzzle was assembled by David Eisenbaugh and Shiro Goto in 1984, um, who actually wrote down a very explicit proof that these degree bounds that we are looking for can be computed from local cohomology. Uh, Eisenbaugh and Goto themselves in the paper claim 
that the result is not original, uh, that it must have been known to Mumford uh, and even to Grothendieck and other people. Uh, but, you know, as is always the case with these great mathematicians, they're not always, but often, they're very modest, <clears throat> right? Uh, so really people attribute this result uh, to Eisenbud uh, and Gottlieb. Uh, so I'm going to spend the rest of my talk today explaining this connection. Okay. Uh, so I will talk about uh, regularity. Uh, okay, and as before, as we did last time, uh, Google's definition of regularity uh, is uh, statements of the uniformities of regularities in the world. They are mere descriptions of the way the world is, uh, the necessitarian theory, laws of nature, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, this is kind of uh, just to connect this with a joke, the dad joke I gave you last time. Uh, anyway, so how does one define regularity? Uh, let me first explain uh, three resolutions. So first, we know from Groth and Dick's result, integrality result, combined with the art and Tate lemma, uh, that uh, the invariants are finitely general. So I can write them as a polynomial algebra in some number of um, polynomials. Okay. So I get a surjection from a polynomial ring in the same number of variables, onto the invariants by just evaluating the variables at the generators. My purpose, though, is to be able to keep track of degrees because that's what I want to know. Okay. So instead of assigning degree one to these variables, I will assign to each variable the degree of the generator in maps. And now this map has a kernel. Okay. This kernel is also finitely generated. So I can repeat the process. I can find a free R module that maps onto the kernel by sending the generator of the jth copy to the generator, to the jth generator of the kernel. But I again keep track of degrees, right? So instead of saying that the EJs here have degree one, I assign to each generator of the free module the degree of the generator of the kernel it maps to. Okay. So I can rewrite this direct sum R plus R plus R as R with degree D1 plus R with degree D2 and so on. This is the same. These two modules are isomorphic as modules. Okay, the grading is. So now I compose this map, this map with that map, right? So I go from the free module to the kernel. The kernel embeds into the polynomial ring, surjects onto the module I'm resolving. Okay. So I get a complex, okay, I get a sequence of maps. Okay. And I repeat, the kernel of the leftmost map is finitely generated. There's a free module that maps onto it subjectively, the jth generator onto the jth generator. The degree of the jth generator is the degree of the element it maps onto, and so on. Okay? I compose this new map with the old sequence. And I keep doing this. If I drop the kernels, okay, I drop the kernels, I relabel uh, these. Um, E dash, instead of having E dash at the second step, E double dash, E triple dash, and so on. It's like candles on a cake, right? After a point, instead of putting 25, 35, 75 candles, you just put numbers, okay? So I just index uh, this by the step I'm following, and I get the graded minimal free resolution of uh, this module, okay, this way. Okay. So the graded free resolution of this module, of any module, okay, of any graded module, it doesn't have to be invariance. There's nothing specific about invariance, uh, is an exact sequence. By construction, the images of these maps I constructed um, are equal to the kernels, right? This is how I define them. Each fi is a free module, so a sum of copies of ours, but I shift the degrees by d, i, j, okay? 
the degree shift is essentially given by the degree of the generator of the kernel of the next map. So we can rewrite F bullet into this big resolution. And this is a graded free resolution. And this is where I want to read my degree bounds. Okay. Let's see a very easy example. Okay. Just to convince uh, our uh, more junior uh, participants uh, that this is a very simple process, at least conceptually, not computationally. Okay. Let me try to resolve this quotient. Uh, viewed as a module over the polynomial variables. Okay. So step zero, I map um, R surjectively onto M by construction. M is a normal module, okay? Just a quotient map. The kernel of that map is the ideal. Okay. So here I have three generators, one, two, three, degrees, three, three, five. So I get three module of rank three, one, two, three, with degrees Three, three, five. I map E1 to X cubed, E2 to XY squared, E3 to Y to Z. I compute the kernel. Okay. The kernel is generated by these two polynomials. Again, it's very simple to see. Y squared E1 is Y squared X cubed. X squared E2 is X cubed Y squared. The same thing. Okay. And the same for the other four. So now I have two generators. So a free module of rank two, degree five, because it's two plus three and degree six. And I map this onto kernel. And it turns out that, of course, this is why I picked this example. The process stops here. Okay, this is, um, there's no need to do anything else. And thus you obtain the free resolution of that module. Okay, uh, which consists of these modules and this matrices which are the nice. Okay. Now, of course, we're interested in invariants. And these are the two examples I showed you last time, invariants under the symmetric group and under the cyclic group. Uh, it turns out that when you want to resolve um, the symmetric uh, group case, uh, elementary symmetric polynomials are algebraically independent. There is no system. Okay, so there's nothing to say here. Whereas in the case of the cyclic group uh, acting on a polynomial ring in two variables, you can verify that the formula I'm giving you here is a non-trivial CTG, okay? But it becomes very quickly, very hard to compute uh, the actual resolution, okay? I can definitely have a computer do it for me in this small case, but if you let your group be bigger uh, and the polynomial be bigger, this is somehow hopeless out there, okay? Uh, so- uh, What is your uh, F3 uh, in M on top line? You mean here? Oh, on top, on, on first line. Here. So F3, what is- Ah, uh, yeah, okay, I copied this twice, sorry, this is a typo. Yeah. F3 is X1 here, yeah. thank you. Okay, this is why this row uh, was so uh, long for me and I couldn't fit something I wanted next to that because I had this time. Anyway, uh, okay. So we have this construction of that applies to any finitely generated module. We construct the minimal free resolution. We record the degrees, okay? At each step for each i free module, I set rho i, to be the biggest degree that appears. So rho zero are the largest degree for the generators. Rho one gives me the largest degree for the relations between the generators, the first module of CTGs. Rho two gives me a bound for the degree of the second module of CTGs. So my definition of the regularity, the first version, is that this is the greatest out of all these degrees. So somehow, something much larger than the degrees of the generator. Of course, it's confusing because I've written that this is a theorem, whereas this is just a definition, right? Uh, and again, the definition is somehow simple, right? It's kind of a tautology. I'm not saying much. 
the theorem of Eisenbot and Goto, Goto sorry, is that this um, definition of regularity agrees with Mumford's original definition of regularity uh, that I will present uh, right away. Okay, so regularity version one via minimal, minimal free resolution, regularity version two via the check complex. Okay. Again, it's a relatively simple construction. I start as before with the module, which is finitely generated over a polynomial ring, invariance, for example. Uh, and I form a complex as follows. Okay. Uh, I start with M. Then I take M localized at every variable. I invert each one of the variables and I take the direct sum. Then I take localization at products of two variables. So I invert x1, x2, x1, x3, x1, x4, and I take the direct sum. And I keep doing this all the way until the end when I localize at the product of all the variables. Okay. Uh, now the maps I haven't given you between them, but I will show you an example, okay, because it's just a, a weird formula that describes something very simple, but there's a very natural map between these localizations. Um, note that the, this check complex is the algebraic version of the complex that computes check homology for sheets, okay? Um, but in any case, uh, the definition, which was not given like this by Glossovic, it was given in terms of derived functors, um, is that I will call local cohomology the cohomology of a complex, okay? Uh, so the thing that measures exactness of a complex, kernels modulo images, okay? As simple as that. And in fact, uh, this cohomology um, the modules are graded by degree. Okay, somehow you can write them as direct sum of homogeneous things uh, because you can always be thinking that everything here uh, is somehow associated to a polynomial ring with some preassigned. Okay, so these are graded. Uh, the co local cohomology is the cohomology of that complex. Uh, let's see a very simple example. Okay, let's see the check complex uh, associated. When my ground ring is a polynomial ring with variables, the module is the ring itself. Okay. So the map from the polynomial ring to the direct sum of the localizations just takes one to one comma one. And then the map from this direct sum to the localization at x, y takes zero, one to one and one, zero to negative one. It's simple. So the zeroth local cohomology is the cohomology at this place here. So the kernel of that map. What is the kernel of that map? Well, a ring element maps to zero if and only if the equivalence classes of the fractions are over one or zero in both of these variables. Which means that there is some power of X and some power of Y that kills R. Okay. which means that there is some power of the ideal generated by X and Y that kills R. So elements of the kernel are elements that are annihilated by the ideals X comma Y to some power. Okay. So the zero local cohomology is the union of all these annihilators if I take them for R. Okay, this is just uh, the notation uh, for the verbal statement I have in the previous slide, okay? Somehow, this justifies uh, that this module is also core, called torsion. This is called the torsion functor. Uh, and this is a non-exact functor. So this is how Grothendieck defined it uh, in the language of sheaves, though, uh, that essentially took this torsion functor, which is not, not exact, and then it took its derived functor to compute the higher cohomology. Okay. Uh, okay. So regularity version two through local cohomology. We have the check complex. Okay. This has some cohomology theory attached to it, which is graded by degree. So at each position i, i is some of these direct sums of localizations. I let AI to be the biggest degree 
for which the local cohomology is non-vanishing. Okay, so I pick the degree for which the local cohomology is non-vanishing. Of course, this implies some vanishing. This requires some vanishing theorems on local cohomology, okay, that I have not stated. These are due to Grothendieck and Archer originally. Okay. But trust me that this definition makes sense. This is a well-defined notion. So the definition that Mumford gave, uh, he called it regularity. I call it H-reg, homogeneous regularity. I will explain why in a minute. Uh, is that I take the biggest degree out of all. Okay. So in short, the largest degree in which local cohomology does not vanish in any place. Okay. So two different definitions of regularity. One is attached to the minimal free resolution and gives us a uniform bound for all generators and all CCGs, okay, a very strong bound. The other is attached to the check complex and is measured by the vanishing of local. And the theorem that Eisenbud and Goto proved that they don't want to take credit for is that these two regularities, one determines the other. Okay. They're not equal, but H reg is the homogeneous version of that. Okay. This is why I use it. It doesn't really matter because these some of the degrees of the excisor are not, um, it's not a big deal in any case. Uh, one determines the other. Okay. Again, Eisenbud and Goto claim that this follows almost immediately from Grothendieck's local duality statement. Okay. Um, but the whole point, and this uh, summarizes uh, almost uh, everything I wanted to say, um, is that these two agree. Okay. So uh, what I will do in the last, next and last lecture is I will use this idea. I will use this idea to prove, uh, to find a degree bound for the generators of invariants of finite groups, okay? And this is the logical dependency of what I described. Maybe I could have shown you just this slide, and this is everything about today's talk, okay? The goal is to bound the degrees of the generators for invariance of finite groups, okay? Uh, but this is more general. It applies to modules over things. By definition, uh, this is, weaker than finding a bound on the, I called it Eisen, but go to regularity, but I mean the regularity assigned to free resolutions. This is the definition of that regularity, one, that it bounds the degrees, not only of the generators, but more things. By the theorem of local duality or Eisen, but go to or Mumford or whoever you want to choose, okay? Uh, this is equivalent to bounding the regularity that comes from the check complex from local but this regularity is determined hmm, by the vanishing of that cohomology theory. And that cohomology theory is a cohomology theory assigned to a complex. Okay? So a complex is split exact in some degree if and only if its cohomology vanishes. This is definition. So it all boils down to studying when this check complex that we saw before with the localizations, when I take my module to be rings of invariance, which degree and above this complex is split exactly, okay? So the main idea, which was essentially Peter Simons' idea for the finite group case, and we implemented it together uh, for finite group schemes, okay, is to prove this much stronger statement of split exactness of the check complex that gives us a bound on degrees of generators, but also, as we will see next time, where I will state my main theorem, it also gives us more, okay? It gives us more results. Uh, it gives us the so-called finite decomposition type, okay? But this is all that I will be doing in the next lecture, okay? Uh, so last time I went over time, this time I don't want to go over time, uh, I will just, conclude uh, with a short story, uh, which is less morbid than it sounds, obituary, right, the Greek necrologia. Um, since I mentioned so much, and Mumford, uh, I mentioned Tate a couple of times, uh, 
Uh, maybe you are aware of this story, uh, but um, I thought it was nice to share if you haven't heard about it. Um, so in 2014, when Grothendieck died, um, Mumford, uh, John Tate and I, I is David Mumford, were asked by nature to write an obituary for Grothendieck. Uh, now he's a hero of mine, the person that I met most deserving of the adjective genius. Uh, I got to know him when he visited Harvard. This is the story that we saw. Um, and John Tate, uh, Shurik, Grothendieck, uh, and I ran a seminar on existence theory. Uh, his devotion to math, blah, blah, he goes on to speak very greatly of him. So the point is that uh, Mumford acknowledges that readership of nature are non-mathematicians. So it's a challenge to make uh, schemes, categories, and cohomology accessible. Uh, so they wrote an obituary, which is titled, Can One Explain Schemes to Biologists? Uh, which he has in his blog, if you want to read. I find it fantastic. Okay. Um, but the plot twist is that this was rejected by the editors of the name. Uh, as being much too technical for the readership. <laughs> and of course, uh, Mumford was furious. <laughs> so the editor wrote to him that higher degree polynomials in infinitesimal vectors and complex spaces uh, where things, at least half the readership, have never come across. The gap between the world I have lived in and that even of scientists has never seemed larger. I'm prepared for lawyers and businessmen to say they hated math uh, and not to remember any math, but this, okay, nature is read by STEM people. All such people are expected to learn a hell lot of math. Very depressing. He was furious. Uh, the conclusion is that, thankfully, you can read all of that in his blog is uh, that uh, they wore them out uh, into a severely stripped down the edit and in the end, it, okay. Uh, so I just wanted to share that story uh, because it's somehow relevant to what we're discussing. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and we will continue next week with the actual original results because nothing I have shown so far Okay, thank you, Costa, again, for the very beautiful and nice talk. Let me stop.